change our hearts by the power of your word. Let our lives be truly transformed for your glory. Lord God, by the time we're done with tonight's teaching, let us have shifted levels in the name of Jesus. Thank you, precious Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Someone shout aloud, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Greet one another with a holy handshake and say you're welcome to praise God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Please, you may be seated. God bless you very quickly. Let us receive the ministry of the word. Hallelujah. Praise God. We celebrate God's grace on, on the lives of all our online family. And we thank you, especially those who have chosen to be consistent through the weeks, the months, and the years. I want you to know that your labor in the Lord's vineyard is not in vain. Your labor in the word is not in vain. Your passion to grow is never a waste. First Peter 2.2. 2. He says, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And the instrumentality for the growth of the believer is the accurate ministry of the word of God. And we thank God for that which he has provided abundantly in this ministry. And I commend you all and the Lord bless you. So tonight, very quickly, we're going to begin. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. What we teach you by the grace of God in this ministry is not an opinion of a man. We do not just wake up from the bed and decide to teach anything. That's not how it works. There is a systematic arrangement of the doctrine of Christ and the scripture that we bring to address the matters of our lives in this phase that we have found ourselves. And so anything that is not based on scriptural principle is an opinion. What we are teaching is not an opinion. It's not old wife's fables. It's not story. It's what is real. It is what has been tested over time through the years, through the ages, through the centuries, through dispensations. And it has never failed because it is the unfading and unfailing principle of the eternal God, the immutable God. So today we want to consider, don't waste your life. We're going to show you a few scripture. John chapter 10, verse 10. John chapter 10, verse 10. Don't waste your life. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Tell your neighbor more abundantly. So what we see here is actually a picture of Jesus as the good shepherd. And one of the things that Jesus was making us to understand is that, listen, in John 10, 9, he said, I'm the door. If by me any man shall enter, he shall be saved. He shall go in and out and find pasture. But in John chapter 10, verse 10, he says, the thief does not come but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And then I've come to give you life. So that tells you that what Jesus came to give mankind is a life that is worth living. The new life that you have received in Christ Jesus is not a life that just counts time. It's a life that is lived for the glory of God. The original design of God for man, beginning from creation, is that man should live for his glory. The end point of true dominion is the glory of God. The Puritans were asked, Many, many centuries ago, what is the chiefest end of man? And they said the chief end of man is the glory of God. To enjoy God forever. To bask in his presence. And to live a life that is worthy of his commendation. And so in John 10, 10, Jesus said, I came to give you a life that is meaningful. A life that is purposeful. A life that has direction. A life that has fulfillment. Because in the earthly ministry of Jesus... We see that there were many who lived, but the way they lived their lives showed to us that it is possible to live long and yet live a wasted life. The the usefulness of a life is not really in the duration of that life, it's in the donation of that life. Another scripture we see very quickly is John chapter 17. 
I know that oftentimes we, we, we call the Lord's Prayer that which we see in Matthew where Jesus was teaching to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. But that's not the Lord's Prayer. That's actually a model prayer for the believer. But this is where we really see the Lord's Prayer. John chapter 17. I'll show you some principles. John 17 verse 1 to 5. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. So what he's actually telling you is that the original assignment for the coming of the son, as prophesied by the prophets of old, even before Malachi, was that the son of man will be born and he will bruise the head of the serpent. If you trace it back to Genesis 3.15, he says the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. He's not talking about a Christian. He's talking about the Christ of God that will come. He does not stop there. And then you see Isaiah, Jeremiah, Nahum, Ezra, the prophets, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Jonah. All of them began to prophesy. And some of them, we call them the Messianic prophets because most of their prophecies were directed towards the Christ that was to come. For example, Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, he says, Unto us a child is born. Do you remember? And unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. For example, you also see Isaiah 63. Who has believed our report? And unto whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Surely shall grow from before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. And then he tells us that he was bruised for iniquities. All right, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. And then he also talks in Isaiah 6, all right, about the seven spirits of God, the spirit of wisdom, all right. He says, counsel and might. And it's all that he's talking about is the Messiah, which is Jesus that was to come. But it does not stop there. Again, you get to the book of Psalms, and you see the psalmist, through prophetic telescoping, begin to talk about the Messiah that is to come. For example, in Psalm 2, he shows you, all right, the sovereign servant that is to come. Jesus will be the Lamb of God. And then he continues even in Psalm 100 and Psalm 110. And then he tells you, he says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make thy enemies thy footstool. He says, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the womb of the morning. He says, For thou hast the dew of their youth. What he's talking about, the Lord saying to my Lord, is the Father speaking to the Son. Now, how will the, the David and the Old Testament prophets would have been able to know why? Because God reveals himself to whoever he chooses. And so what we see in the life of Jesus, although Methuselah lived 969, Jesus did not live 969, meaning if Jesus was to come 30 times, Methuselah would still be, I think, quite older, right? Jesus did 33 and a half. 33 times um, 30, that should be about 9... 990 or thereabouts. So, so that means Jesus would need to come about 30 times to really be age mates with men like Methuselah. But what we read about Methuselah was that he lived very long. What we read about Jesus is not that he lived very long. It was that he lived fulfilled and died empty, having fulfilled the assignment of the Father. Jesus came to earth and he was mission conscious. Jesus came to earth and he did not waste any second. Why? Because one of the safeguards, if you will not waste your life on the face of the earth, is that you must live for purpose. That's the first principle. Purpose is your sure guarantee for living a life that is worth living. It's a life that escapes the destruction that is wasting many today. The hollowness and the emptiness that pervades our culture. 1 John 3, 8, it says, for this purpose... The Son of God was made manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. You see Jesus on the cross, at Calvary's cross, when he said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God. Do you remember? Why have you forsaken me? Somebody may say, wow, if Jesus is truly God, how can he be asking such a question? No, no, no. What Jesus was doing was he was, he was actually fulfilling prophecy. Because the psalmist also said it in the book of Psalms. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's only fulfilling what was said concerning him. It's not that Jesus was confused about his identity. Your life begins to waste when you have not discovered God's purpose for creating you. By the grace of God in this ministry, we have had over 30 different kinds of teachings on purpose or thereabouts. And you need to understand 
that when I talk about purpose, with respect to not wasting your time, what you need to first understand is that you were created by God and for God. Sometimes, people like to believe that they were created by God, but they go ahead to live for themselves. Romans 1.21, he says, although they knew God, yet did not glorify him as God, therefore their foolish heart was darkened. But that's not the case of Jesus and everyone who ever achieved the will of God for their lives in their own generation. The Bible says, David served his generation according to the will of God. And when he was done, the Bible says he rested with his fathers, meaning he died. You are not permitted to die until you have fulfilled the reason why you were created. Why did you notice that in the earthly ministry of Jesus, Jesus never wasted time? Do you notice he never wasted time? For example, in John 4, the Bible speaks about Jesus. He says, and he must need go through Samaria. Why? Because evangelism was to take place in that territory. And he needed a woman that he was going to reach out to first, who will be the gate, key, um, who will be the key to the city. And the Bible says the disciples went to look for food. That's how you know a man that is wasting his life. He is more concerned about the ephemeral and ignores that which is eternal. Purpose is not, listen, your purpose, I, I, a lot of people talk about purpose but do not understand it. You know, you can teach a master class on something you don't understand. Purpose does not begin in time. Purpose begins from eternity and enters into time and then continues in eternity. The purpose of man was not to end on earth. If it was to end on earth, it was a waste of life. Because what, will, what then will differentiate man from an animal? Are you following? Just trying to lay a foundation. The purpose of God for man began from God. Therefore, the purpose of man is actually an eternal purpose. And it begins with the glory of God. In John 17, Jesus says, The hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, and that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Verse 3 says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Look at verse 4 now. If you have your Bibles there. Very important. He says, I have glorified you on the earth. Please look up. Did he say, I have glorified you by singing and dancing? Did he say, I have glorified you by doing what I please? No. Did he say, I have glorified you by enjoying life? No. He says, I have glorified you. How? Now, let's see now. By, by doing what? I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Now, there are about seven calls. Now, if you read my book, Young Ministers and Ministry, you are going to find that there are about seven calls, all right, um, of God for a man. Most, you know, importantly. There are other auxiliary, but, but seven important calls. And I'll just give you three of them. There is the call to fellowship. That's a call to, to intimacy with God. But the call to fellowship is preceded by the call to repentance. Remember, when John came preaching, he says, repent, therefore, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus came in Matthew 4, he says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When the apostles came, they said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So you actually see that there is the call to repentance, which leads to receiving and responding to the call to fellowship. But the call to repentance and fellowship is not the, the final thing that God wants us to do. The outflow of your fellowship with God is going to culminate into discovery of your earthly purpose. Are you seeing that? So, your purpose is not time-bound with respect to God's final assignment for you. Because if all you were created to be is actually to do rather than becoming, then your life is going to be like that of an animal or a robot. But firstly, God creates you for fellowship with himself, and then on the basis of your intimacy with him, then he now continues to now give you another one, which is Genesis 1, 26 to 28. He says, let us make man in our image, and after our likeness, and let them have what now? Dominion. Meaning that on the, on the basis of you becoming God's image, and that does not mean you have hands, God has hands, you have eyes, your eyes are like God's eyes, that's not what it means. What it means is that the, 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 the same spirit component that God actually has that spirit component in man. That's what differentiates you from animals. Animals don't have spirits. If animals had spirits, then the blood of Jesus too must be shed. Do you see that? 
for them, and they too must repent and be saved. But no, they don't have spirits. Once they die, that's all. That's why whether animals will get to heaven or not should not really be the argument. The argument should be you. Will you get to heaven? But we're going somewhere. Praise God. So, Jesus' goal was that he would fulfill the assignment of his father, which began from eternity into time. So, as you fellowship with God, one of the fruit of your fellowship with God, most times, we've been taught that the way to discover your purpose is to look inside yourself. But a faithful student of anatomy knows that looking inside yourself, you are only going to be able to see your esophagus, your pancreas, your liver. Do you see that now? Your kidneys, your lungs. Those are the things you would see there. Your, your large and small intestine. But to discover your purpose, you don't look at yourself. You first look to God. Why? Since you were created in his image and in his likeness for his purpose, you can only look to the manufacturer to discover why you are here. And so there are many people today who are living unexamined lives. Someone once said that an unexamined life is not worth living. So what I'm going to do tonight is to streamline this teaching with respect to how not to waste your time. If you are with me, say amen. amen. If you are catching something, say hallelujah. hallelujah. Now let's go. Let's run uh, back to the Old Testament. Look at the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Ecclesiastes. Sorry, let's do 12. Ecclesiastes 12. Verse 1. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no player in them. Verse 2, while the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened and the clouds do not return after the rain. Go to verse 6 and 8. If you are there, can we read it together? Verse 6 and 8 now, let's go. Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the well, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Please read verse 8 loud and clear. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All is vanity. Can we read verse 13 and 14 now? Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandment. For this is the will of God for man. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing. So, meaning that there is a tendency in every human to forget his creator. Once you are born of a woman, as a result of the principle of corporate or collective responsibility, that the soul that sins shall die. And in Adam, all of us sinned. There is that tendency, as a result of the fall, to forget God. So not even think that you're on earth because a God permitted you. Do you see why abortion is deadly? People think that life begins at conception. Actually, scripture tells us that life begins before conception. What do I mean by that? Before the mother of Jacob and Esau hosted them in the womb, God said, listen, you may not know, but already had plans for them. Meaning that your purpose precedes your creation. So when a mother or a woman takes the life of a child because she, she doesn't want to feel inconvenienced or because she's not... See, whatever the reason is, that is an immoral reason. The child in the womb has as much right as the parents of that child. You can see a couple waiting for 16 years on the Lord for just one child. And they'll be rolling on the floor. God, just one child. Is that true? And you can see a girl. Why? Because, like somebody has rightly said, if the purpose of a thing is not known, the abuse of it will be inevitable. So, the, the, the girl is abusing her womb. Why? She does not know why God gave her the womb. She can be flushing the baby in the, all right, wherever she flushes it. Every three, three weeks or every two, two months. I don't know, <laughs> you know. And only God knows how many kinds of destinies has been flushed out like that. Terminated because a person 
chooses to enjoy pleasure but hates responsibility. Are you catching something? Remember your creator now while you are young. And thank God we are young people here so I can talk to us. It is possible that because you are young, you have energy. Is that true? You, you, are, you are vibrant. But listen, a lot of us are channeling our energies into things that will not matter when we are about to close our eyes in death. Let me read a hymn to you that I've been singing for some days now. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of his resurrection share, when his chosen ones shall gather to their own beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. This is the third stanza. Let me labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let me talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then we all of life, sorry, then when all of life is over and my walk on earth is done and the role is called up yonder, I'll be there. Listen, the child of God, hear this as a Christian, don't forget this. You will not be saved based on your works on earth, but you will be rewarded based on your works on earth. If you do not live for God's purpose, it does not matter what you did. If it was not for God's purpose, you have wasted your time, the time of those that God ought to have sent you to, and you have wasted the resources that God gave to you. It's called the tragedy of a wasted life. You have only one life to live. Here and now. But the consequences of the life that you live here and now are eternal in their scope. Without God requiring the author of the popular book, The Purpose Driven Life, every youth should try to read that book. There are critics here and there, but the, the book is a blessing. The Purpose Driven Life. He says, without God, life has no meaning. And without purpose, life has no meaning. Sorry, without God, life has no purpose. Without purpose, life has no meaning. Without meaning, life has no significance. Without God, life has no purpose. Without purpose, life has no meaning. Without meaning, life has no significance. That's why I agree 100% with Dr. Mausmur of Blessed Memory, who said that the greatest tragedy on earth is not losing your life it's not death it's a life without purpose why because like a gyros like a pendulum you are driven by the wind you are carried away by fashion you are carried away by trends anything can lead you when you have not discovered your purpose when you are not living for god's purpose the same 24 hours that the slow god has in the book of proverbs it's the same 24 hours that the diligent man has, but their results are not the same. He says in Proverbs 22 and verse 24, See as thou a man that is diligent in his business. He says he will stand before kings and not in the midst of mere men. Proverbs 12, 22. He says the hand of the diligent will bear rule. Your life can either be invested or wasted. In Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 10, the preacher said, if the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. But wisdom brings success. If the axe head is blunt, what is he telling you? Listen, even the axe head has an assignment, but it is not sharpened. And that's why what I'm about to begin to tell you just shortly is going to change your life if you pay attention to it. If you're following online, please give it your best to listen. Because these things I'm sharing with you are, are eternal truths. They do not fail. Tell your neighbor, they don't fail. <laughs> they don't fail. Now, let's run a little now. 
In Esther chapter 4 and verse 14. Esther chapter 4 and verse 14. The Bible makes us to understand, all right, just a little, um, you know, story concerning Esther. Esther was a beautiful young girl who had lost her parents. And then Mordecai, all right, her uncle was like, um, you know, a parent sort of mentoring her, discipling her. But it got to a point in time where Vashti, the wife of the king, messed up. And then the king needed another, all right, queen. And there was a beauty pageant, all right, in his territory. And the Bible makes us to understand that they came to bring Esther. But um, cut the long story short, although we see the providence of God at work, the book of Esther is one of the books of the Bible where God was not mentioned once, but we see the hand of God in every chapter of the book of Esther. Now, the Bible makes us to understand that it got to a point in time. Maybe we should see it together so that you, you, it will minister powerfully to you. Esther, just look at chapter 4. Esther chapter 4, we'll just do verse 14 only. Esther chapter 4 and verse 14. Now, if you're there, can we read it together? Are you there? Esther 4, 14. Can we read it together, please? Just that scripture only. One to go. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. Now, that tells you that your replacement is waiting Every time you waste what God has given you, your replacement is waiting for you. And most times when we talk about purpose, we only streamline it to gifts and abilities. It's bigger than that. Listen, opportunity has purpose embedded in it. Relationships has purpose embedded in it. Platforms has purpose embedded in it. Positions are for purposes. And that's what we see in the book of Esther here. God already gave her a strategic position. Or else, the Holocaust, the Jews will be wasted, annihilated, just like it happened in the days of Adolf Hitler. Only God knows who would have been the Esther to stop Adolf Hitler, but did not fulfill her ministry. Only God knows. See what it says here? If you remain completely silent at this time, if you try to play it safe, the safest place on earth is the graveyard. But in Nigeria, it's not so anymore. Why? Because even the graveyard now, things are happening there. Is that true? The body that dies, that we should say rest in peace. Even that body now, they can dig it out and begin to sell the body parts. Highest bidder. Are you following me? The guy was alive. He had only 876 naira in his bank account. When he dies, you can be surprised they can sell his body parts for 6 million. Are you following? <laughs> Are you still here? If you remain completely silent, you try to play it safe at this time. Just like many young people are wasting their lives now. Rather than stand for truth and stand for the word of God and do what is right and serve God's purpose. No, you are carried away. You want to play safe. You, are, you, you don't want to be uh, labeled as a Christian fanatic. You don't want to be labeled as somebody who is too serious with God. You don't even want to be identified with the ministry that waters you. You see, all those things, listen, time is a privilege to always sow a seed. Every hour of your life is a seed that you will reap the harvest. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Every moment that you spend on the face of the earth is a seed. And the harvest is waiting for you. Whether good or bad. Say, behold, I stand. Behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. Esther, although you are beautiful, although you have been mentored, now is the time to stand your ground and speak for the Jews. And I love Mordecai. He told her very clearly, if you refuse to do it, the deliverance of the Jews is going to arise from another place. You know what that also means? Nobody is in the indispensable in the kingdom of God. Nobody is indispensable in the kingdom of God. Don't see yourself. Let us not get to that point where we see ourselves as indispensable. Oh, they cannot do without me. It may be in your workplace. It may be in your family. It may be among your siblings. I know there are all kinds of prayer points that say, Oh God, make me the star of my family so that they can no hold any meeting if I'm not there. You see, all those things are part of the extensions of carnality. Are you following me? That's not really the goal. That's not why God wants to lift you in that family so that when they are, they are doing meetings, if you are not there. Listen, it's not about your presence or your absence. It's about your influence. Are you following now? Are you still here? That if you fail to arise and take responsibility for your life, you will waste every hour. You know, I think it was yesterday. My wife and I decided every hour of the day, 
Okay, okay, for some hours of the day, not every hour. For some hours of the day, we're going to be praying. I think it was on a Friday. We're going to be praying. And guess what? Before we knew it, I learned a very powerful principle that has changed my life. What did I learn? An hour from the other hour is not actually far. It's you that think it's, it's long. It's not long. Because as we are completing the prayer now, very soon we are returned again. Ah, that means if you will be giving account of your life for every hour, you'll be very productive. Because you find out that you will not know when you have used six hours to play Ludo. Six hours. Then you will say, oh, I've not done anything today. You will not know when you have used 12 hours of your life on Netflix. In a day. And you will be surprised that there are those who do six, six hours minimum daily. Four hours daily. By the time they die and they give a, an aggregate of their time spent on movies. You may be surprised, you may see eight years on movie. And the person lived for 52 years. And he has spent eight on movies. Remember that we also sleep for long, most times, right? By the time you remove sleep, feeding, bathing, dressing, miscellaneous, you'll be so surprised that it is possible that some people, the culmination of the hours they spent pursuing God's purpose for their lives may not be up to one day. Out of 50 years. In fact, it is possible to live for 50 years. You know, when you multiply 50 years, times 24 hours, all right, times that, you will be surprised how many hours a man has lived, and yet the man may go to the grave without ever discovering the reason why he was created. In fact, some have discovered why they were created, but they will not pursue it. Why? This would have happened to Esther. It's not enough to go for a church program, and they say there is the Esther anointing. You know, we like the Esther anointing. There is an Esther anointing or a Deborah anointing here. And even young ministers that don't even study their scriptures will say, hey, I see a prophetic anointing in the house right now. And you see ladies, oh, but, but by the time the service is over, they didn't prophesy. You, at least if there is a prophetic anointing, what should happen? You should what now? At least, at least. <laughs> so the question is, all the goosebumps is not what we need now. What we need is all hands on deck fulfilling God's purpose. Feelings or, not feel, or no feelings. Are you still together? He spoke to us. May God give you leaders. And, and that's one of the things I'm learning currently. And my wife has been telling me about it. May God give you leaders who have the spine to tell you that you are wrong. Early in life, before you make a mess of everything. I'm telling you the truth. The Bible says, he that is often rebuked and still hardens his neck. He says, sudden destruction is going to come upon him. Now, what about him that is not rebuked? There is a way that seems right unto a young man, unto a young woman, unto a lady. There is a way that looks right. But the end of it, the Bible says it is the ways of death or it is destruction. Why? You were never designed by God to create and construct your own way. You are not Julius Beggar. You were cre in fact, Julius Beggar cannot create their own way. It's what the government said they want that they must do. Are you following me? Your creativity is not what we are looking for. Your yieldedness is the most important thing. Many people are, they are, they are doing experiments with their lives. Because they are science students, you'll be surprised. On that day, everything you do with your life, you give account for it. I can't promise you that there will be a big television, but you will give account. Amen. Don't know about no television. Praise God. He says if if you remain completely silent at this time, and I want to challenge you, don't be silent at this time. You should be engaged for God at whatever level. That's why remember the mandate of this ministry is reaching the lost and what now? Equipping the same. But listen, if we are trying to equip you, but you are in a haste to manifest in court, it's like a tray that has nothing on it. When it gets to the recipient, it's emptiness that you will deliver. When they say, sit, listen, you, you are not qualified to stand to teach until you have sat to sit, to, to be taught. If Esther was not submitted to the discipleship program of Mordecai, Esther will miss her purpose, although she's in the right position. Do you know how many people are in government today who were not properly discipled and they are becoming a, a thorn in the flesh? To our nation. Why? They are Christians, but they are not discipled Christians. Oh my goodness. Are you following? Says if you, 
If you refuse to speak up, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet, who knows uh -huh, whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I want to announce to you. And then Esther responded quickly. She said, go gather the Jews. Let them fast and pray. Let's see what will happen. You know what that means? Maybe you were also saved and you are in this ministry and you are listening to my teaching from wherever for such a time, what? As this. Meaning this is the best time to be alive for you. Someone once said, I wish I was alive in the days of Jesus so that I would touch his robe. Ah. Uh, so that I will hug him. I will not let him go. Jesus, your mate. You will hug him. You will not. If you hug him, what will he do to you? Do you know how many people must have thought Jesus and their lives did not change? The Bible says many pronged him, but nothing changed about them. Why? Because it is possible to be alive in the days of Jesus. And like the Pharisees and Sadducees, you will not be saved. Why? Because if the Spirit does not reveal Christ to you, even your being physically present in Jesus' earthly ministry will not do you any profit. Are you learning? Tell your neighbor, live for purpose. Without purpose, without direction, without intentionality, you will waste time. And you see, time is indispensable. Time waits for no man. You are getting older. In fact, while we're growing up, some of our classmates in secondary school, they quickly wanted to grow beards. And then they will say, um, if you want to grow beards, um, this is what you should do. Get cream. Who this? Do that. And they kept hustling for the beard. But later they found out that even beards can be a body. They wanted to have the front. Do you see that? You want to have the image of an old person. Forgetting that there is responsibility attached to that beard. Just like young ladies today now, we heard that there are new things that are on sale. Things like Tommy, Tommy Slimmers, Botox Expanders, Chest Exploders, Whitening Cream. Oh my God. And other things that, I can, they, that they will be difficult to mention. And I'm shocked. That you may see a 12-year-old girl. You know, listen, one of the ways to know a lady is that how a lady's physique will be in the future, for young men listening, is that you look at the lady's mother. Are you following me? Okay, you're not with me. Let's continue. Are you still here? Look at the lady's mother. Suddenly, this girl, you look at her mother and all her ancestors. Nobody has, the, her hips has become like the hips of hippopotamus. You will marry hips, but there is no content, no substance. No capacity, no character, no sense of mission. The day you say you want to sacrifice something to fulfill God's purpose, she will become the enemy of your progress. Be careful that you don't place your immediate gratification, your craving to be pleased right now over something that is of superior value, which is the will of God for your life, specifically in such a time as this. Tell your neighbor, are you alive? alive? I know the person is not responding. Say, I'm, are you alive now? You alive? So the purpose of God is the glory of God. God does not play dice with our lives. And we shouldn't either. One time we were playing, um, you know, Ludo. You know Ludo, you know Ludo games now? You know Ludo games, right? Ludo now. You know dice. You know dice. You know when we were growing up, I don't know if you threw dice. You remove it from the plastic, then you, you put it on your hand and say something and throw it. Some of us have hands for double six. And you know when you throw double six, double six can, you can throw it again. And, but do you know it's fluke? It's just like what they taught you in secondary school, probability. Don't think there is somebody who has a calling for double six. It's not true. It, it's probability. Is that true? That's how many people are living their lives. God said there is a sure, now God sure pass. God said there is a sure path. You say, no, I want probability. I like qui sera, sera. Whatever will be. Listen, there is nothing called luck. There is nothing called chance. There is nothing called fate. Luck is dumb. Fate is, listen, fortune is blind. Only God is just. Are you following? People without purpose are like a ship without a rudder. You can spend many years. With fuel, 
driving on the ocean, but there is no steering wheel. And that means that you may, you may get to the end of the ocean and then you find out that you were on the wrong path. Why? There was no direction. Purpose gives direction to your daily activities. When you see a man who does not have no to-do list, he say, ah, I just leave it as it comes. Anyhow, anyhow. You will never be productive if you are not specific about what you are doing with your time. Hear me now. I'm giving you a counsel about the message of God. I know that the year is winding down, but hear me now. Don't waste your time following a ministry that is not committed to discipleship. Don't waste your time following a prophet that is not, come, that is not consistent with the truth of the word of God. Don't waste your time putting your money in a place where your soul is being abused. Well, people do not even know that you can be abused and you don't even know. Don't waste your time by investing your emotions in a relationship that is ungodly. Don't waste your time playing when you ought to be working. Listen, purpose gives priority to your life. It gives shape to your life. In fact, purpose influences, is, is, inspires discipline in you. My dear, be encouraged to say no when you need to say no. D never feel bad for saying no. People say, we want you to go do this. We want you to go do that. And you are a volunteer in everything. Listen, if you volunteer in everything, you will soon tear apart. Some of you belong to about 37 and a half ministries. You will never be able to be established as a young man if you follow every ministry, every Tom, Dick and Harry, everywhere. No. You take everything in. Hook, line and sinker. Listen, the Bible does not say they that run about shall be established. He says they that be planted in the house of God shall flourish in the courts of our God. You cannot flourish until you are planted. If you are not, listen, let us ask you, where exactly are you? Ask your neighbor, where exactly are you? And tell me you are, you are, we are here, we are also here, we are also here, we are also here, only you. Are you a chameleon Christian? Are you still with me now? Without purpose, guilt will drive your life. The past will haunt your life. Resentment will cloud your judgment. Fear will threaten you from advancing. Materialism will become your God. The approval of men will become your idol. And it will drive your life to a grinding halt. Sometimes people never rise from such catastrophe. Purpose determines design. Remember, I've taught on the law of design and functionality. Purpose determines design. And design influences your function. When you see a broom, you know that you cannot use a broom to be fanning yourself. You say, ah, the broom fans, it fans better. Hey, it fans better. That's, that's mediocrity. That's an abuse of the broom. You can't say, ah, fan. Fan sweeps better. Fan sweeps better. No. That's not the design. All right, that, that's not the purpose the designer of the fan intended it to do. Could it be that you have been abusing your life in the last 15 years, 10 years, 30 years, 80 years, and you don't even know? You've been eating well, but you have not been living right. Romans 8, 28, he says, we know, we know, we are not guessing about it. We know that all things work together for good to them that Love the Lord and to those who are the called according to his purpose. You see purpose there. God is a God of purpose. Creation itself exists because of the purpose of God. Everything on the face of the earth that God permits to exist, exists for a purpose. Will I surprise you? Let's talk about it a little. Do you know that your skin, I think, is one of the largest um, all right, uh, parts of your body, your skin? And do you know that your skin actually is like a detector? Do you know your skin tells you things you don't even know? Your skin is like a signal agent. You may not know. You know your skin has sweat pores. Do you know? Do you know it has a purpose? Do you know? Do you know that your skin, do you know that you can feel with your skin? Is that correct? Do you know that a leper cannot feel with his skin? Do you know that if a leper puts his leg in fire, he may not even know that he's inside fire till he burns to death? But guess what? 
God gave you that skin for a reason. Do you know that the legs of the eagle has its own purpose? And sometimes the eagle picks up something that is three times its size. Why? Because there is a design for it. Do you know that all the animals in the bush, including the thousands of the species of the fish, fish in the aquarium or in the river or in the ocean, do you know that all of them, the way they were designed intricately, there was a purpose for their fins. Some of you just see fish, you see the fins. You say, cut it away. That fish, if it was alive, the fish would beg you. Don't cut it away. It may be part of his respiratory system and you don't even know. Recently, I found out something. I won't mention the name because I'm not a doctor. If I, go, if I don't mention it right, I, I, may be, I may be penalized. There is a part of your eye. Just take a careful look at your eye. Just this right corner or the left corner. You are going to see a very tiny hole there. And that hole actually secretes tears when you cry. And the tear is much. It takes it. And that's why sometimes when you cry, some of the tears goes into your nostrils and it comes out. Have you noticed? You, and you've not noticed because you thought it's that thing coming from your nose when you cry. It's not really from your nose, it's from your eyes. God did it there. So that means there are many parts of your body that is fulfilling a purpose that you don't even know that it is fulfilling. Unfortunately, you that owns the body may not be fulfilling purpose. So your kidney is working every day, hoping that hey, the person is using this food to fulfill purpose, but is using the food because of the next sinful escapade that he wants to go for. Live for God's purpose. That's how not to waste your time. That's how not to waste your life. Jesus says, I must do the works of him that sent me while it is day. For the night cometh when no man. Ah, when you see a man of purpose. Listen, men of purpose are contagious in their existence. When you are around them, you, your mediocrity, you become uncomfortable with your mediocre life. You spend two hours working in a day. Then you say, hey, I'm tired. Two hours out of 24 Two hours, you slept for 12 hours, you work for two hours, and you say, I will rest for the remaining. What do you mean by that? You should, listen, you should be around people that challenge you. Like begets like. Follow people that know where they are going with their lives. Even if you don't know where you are going, their presence and their wisdom and their manner of life is going to soon rub off on you. He that walks with wise men shall be wise. The companion of fools shall be destroyed. Purpose, choose your friendships. Go and check it. I can look at a man's friends and know. Charles Tremendous Jones. He said, show me your friend and I'll tell you who you are. Somebody else said, show me your friends and I'll tell you where you are going. Purpose. Are you intentional? The last 72 hours of your life, what has it counted for the glory of God? What profit has it brought to the kingdom of God? You are in a ministry. What at, listen, if your presence does not make a difference, your absence will not make a difference. Some of you are in this ministry. Well, I, I guess they are, maybe, maybe they are online or they are, they are elsewhere, but not those of you here, because I know those of you here. Praise God. There are people who have joined the ministry. They only joined by WhatsApp 10 megabyte uh, subscription. I mean, 10 megabyte data, but their heart is not there. Why? Number one, their time is not in the teachings. They don't listen to what we are teaching. But they will go about saying, oh, this person is my mentor. Listen, we see the marks of mentorship in the life of only those who submit to mentorship. We can, listen, it's like a trademark. I know my sons and my sons know me, amen? There is a difference between a fan, fanza and a son. A son does not need to be commanded or instructed or psyched, or psyched to do what is right. Sons are loyal without motive. They don't need to be motivated. They are their own motivation. Are you following me? Purpose. So take, listen, this is what we're going to do. Concerning purpose, apart from our series, all right, in the ministry on purpose, one of the things that you must do is that take a stock. This is November. Don't do, I know many Christians like end of the year retreats. And what does that mean? December 31st, they will not lock themselves for two hours. They say, oh, shakata, kadabaya. Oh, rabababababaye. What have you been doing since January? While it is good to do end of the year retreat, I've done teachings concerning that. Listen, how about start, that your new year resolution you are planning for January 1, that you will not do in January 1. Can you start it this November? Can you start it now? Most things you postpone for later are actually needed yesterday. Are you following me now? That means some things are already overdue. 
There's no point waiting till January 1 before you get serious. Start now. Tell your neighbor, start now. Start now. Be intentional about your life. Let us look at you and know that you are. Listen, as you listen, as you check the music on your phone, and as you check the audio teachings on your phone, and as you see your library, and as you know that you are, you are, you are a person going somewhere. Dr. John C. Maxwell taught that the way to multiply your influence as a leader is not to lead followers, it's to lead leaders. What does that mean? Invest in people who already have a sense of direction. They will appreciate it. Are you saying that? Number two, because of my time. Number two. Are you getting blessed now? Number two. How not to waste your life? Number one, we said live for God's purpose. Let God's purpose be the overarching theme of your life. Now, if it is not for the purpose, the solid deo gloria, if it is not for the glory of God, he said, whatsoever thing you have, your hands find to do, do it with all your might. He said, do it well. He said, do it unto the glory of God. Do it unto the Lord. Are you serving? Serve as unto the Lord. Are you preaching? Preach as unto the Lord. Are you a disciple? Be a disciple as though you are following the Lord. Don't be one of those who, when your disciple, your mentor, your pastor, hears about you or thinks about you, there's no joy. Your, your name is a killjoy name. You know, killjoy. Meaning, once they hear your name, they say, oh, no, hey. no. Praise God. Number two, discipline. The way to not waste your life is be disciplined. I'm going to be as simple as I can. Be disciplined. Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. Oh, I love Daniel so much. My elder brother's name is Daniel. Maybe that's why I love Daniel so much. I don't know. But I've studied the book of Daniel about three times. And I can tell you what is there. Now, Daniel, before he was named Belteshaz and all that, Daniel himself was a man that had a walk with God and had discovered God's purpose for his life and was living in accordance with that. Listen, when you have discovered purpose, you will propose in your heart what to do and what not to do. Purpose fuels discipline. That's what I mean. In Daniel chapter 1 verse 8, let us see quickly. Because in ancient times, all right, there were foods that were sacrificed to idols. And you know that the king too was not a Christian. He was an idol worshiper. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. Now in Daniel chapter 1 verse 8, because of time, the Bible says, but Daniel proposed in his heart, if, if, you, if you listen to our, our teachings on kingdom enterprise and all that, you'd have seen, all right, the anatomy of these um, things with respect to Daniel chapter 1, verse 4. He says, young men, in whom there was no blemish, good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, quick to understand, ability to serve in the king's palace, whom they might teach the language and the literature of the Chaldeans, which is one of the most difficult languages on the earth. That if you look at those six qualifications of the men that could stand in the presence of a king that was not godly, then you check it with your own life. You may be surprised that you may score two over six. And here you are saying, God, if you don't use me, I'll... <laughs> no. But in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, something interesting happens. He says, Daniel bought, bought, bought. Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meal. Or with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with wine, which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Purpose fuels discipline. Daniel said, listen. Okay, let me ask you a question. If you were to go to the presidential villa today, you've noticed that most of our senators have pot belly. Have you noticed? Eh? Okay, leave presidential villa. If you go to a party where they say serve yourself, it's possible in a man's lifetime that he never goes to a party where they say serve yourself till he dies. Don't lie. The rice is now 50,000 or something. <laughs> serve yourself, care. Okay? Let them serve you, daddy. <laughs> and they say, okay, serve yourself party. They still do it anyway. How you know a man that is not disciplined is that what he wants is to consume everything consumable. Even if it means he will not be able to stand up to walk home. Discipline. But think about it. Shawarma, ketchup, uh, fried rice, green peas, uh, jollof rice, 
chicken, coleslaw. Give me those things now. Barbecue, plantain, the fat ones. Not the one plantain that you cut into 37 and a half. The, the, the one that maybe just one, but you cut into like four or five. That when you eat one, you are happy. It's not a thought of plantain. Are you following me now? Then, the other condiments and assortment, beef here, uh, croaker fish here, titles here, salmon here, all those things, you know, crayfish, crab, shrimp, you know, and all that. Then there is lemonade, there is, uh, uh, you know, all those things are there. Let me know. <laughs> because someone's already, hey, hey. Just calm down now. There's Hollandia you got. Oh, amen. For Hollandia you got. Is there. And catfish. Pepper soup. The one that is, the, the eggs are like double silencer of, of, of a car. <laughs> I know it now. I've seen it before, at least. Now, you get there. And the aroma, you know the aroma. You know, these are not chefs of the one Alabele chef that as they are, you know, what I mean is quack chef, that as, as they are cooking, is already burning. Everybody will say, oh, is it burning or is it he's cooking? That's how he cooks. No. This one that they, in, in Dubai or in America, there's a way those chefs, when they roll it, now they spin it. And like French fries, French fries. Then the aroma pervades the atmosphere. Suddenly, uh, your anatomical composition begins to adjust. Because now, something has gone to your nose and then to your brain and told you, hey, it's time to eat something. But because Daniel was a man of purpose, his emotions and his appetite will not control his life. A man that is subject to his emotions, his feelings, and his appetite will never do a, any great thing in the kingdom of God. Whose God is their belly? Who mind deadly things? What do you worship? Your appetite. That's why many of you, if you want to be great, you must be ready to inconvenience yourself. Nothing great was achieved in convenience. One of our ladies in the UK was giving her feedback concerning the quick Bible course that we had. We're having another session next year about the grace of God. And she was saying it was stretching, it was drilling. But it was her best, it was one of our best decisions this year. I said, that's it. If it does not stretch you, it's a waste of your time. Go and check it. Anything you engage in that does not demand anything from you, you will never be great at it. Some of you listen to the best of music composers and you think it was just do re mi fa so. No, no, no. It took time. Ludwig van Beethoven, J.F. Mozart. It took time. You think they were singing? Eba, Eba, Eba. You think that's what they were singing there? Do you know how many hours it took? They said, Eba, Eba, let me do Eba. That's not what they were doing. No. Some of them spent hours, in fact, the basic rule, according to Malcolm Gladwell, was 10,000 hours on anything you want to be proficient in. Do you know what that means? To spend 10,000 hours. How many hours do we have in a year? To now spend 10,000 hours on one thing, at least, to be intermediate. How many hours are you spending on what really matters to your destiny? Discipline yourself for the sake of godliness. Discipline yourself for the sake of where you are going. Because, listen... Your talent and your giftings may open doors for you like you have heard. But it is the discipline that you engage that will sustain. Tell your neighbor discipline. Okay, let me show you something. Genesis chapter 49. There's a story of a man called Reuben. By the grace of God, beginning from January next year, we are going to enter a series where we'll be examining maybe 16 or 17 Bible characters. It's going to be a very huge blessing. To men in the body of Christ. Genesis chapter 49. We will just do verse 1 to 4. Discipline. Why? Notice I did not put discipline before purpose. I put purpose before discipline. Because if you are disciplined without direction, it's a waste of discipline. No? Genesis 49. These are Jacob's last words to his sons. And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. Reuben. Somebody say Reuben. Uh-huh. Reuben. You are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power, unstable as water, you shall not excel. Why? Because, you know, the Bible says a costless cost cannot stand. Abby? But this one is cost cost. So it stands. What is he saying now? 
because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. He says, he gives us two things here that I just want us to pay attention to because of time. Number one, he says, uh, unstable as water. You know what that means? One of the marks of discipline is consistency. That's the, one of the proofs that you are disciplined or you are cultivating discipline is consistency. Go and check it. It takes discipline to be consistent, actually. Do you know what it means to stay with one thing for a long time? Many are oscillating between many things. Today, you say you are an evangelist. Tomorrow, you are a motivational speaker. Next week, you are a master class convener. Upper week, you are an Amazon. Op Next week again, you are a dancer. You are confused like that. To be spectacular, you must be specific. Unstable as water. You know what he's telling you? Water is unstable. Remember, even Jesus said, toast, to and fro. You see that? Paul said he toast, to and fro. Ephesians 4. So that tells you that just like water is not stable. All right? You see the waves and all that. That's how some lives are. And that's why they don't, they don't head in the right direction. Have you been to Bar Beach before? The water is suddenly coming now as though it wants to come and do something. Then when it gets there, what does it do? Then it recedes again. That's how many lives are. Hey! You say it's a promise. This is about to. Then again. Discipline. What about Esau? Okay, the second thing we see concerning Reuben. He says, because you went to your father's, how can you go and commit sexual immorality with your father's woman. You know what that tells you? There's no fear of God in his heart. Your father's, let me put it in our modern language, your father's speck suddenly becomes your speck. Then there's a problem somewhere. Big one. Genesis 25. Tw Genesis 25, 29 to 34. There is a man there that you need to know his name. Genesis 25, 29 to 34. His name is Esau. This is the story of Esau selling his birthright. Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please, feed me with the same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Verse 31, what Jacob said. Tell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Look up. Most times we say Jacob stole his birthright. Did Jacob steal his birthright? No. He said he sold it. Hello, sir. Are you still here? And Jacob gave Esau. Bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose, and went his way. Then Esau, thus Esau despised his birthright. Now remember, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 17, the writer of Hebrews tells us something concerning Esau. That Esau was profane. And this is how he puts it. For you know, he says, Lest there be, Hebrews 12, 16 and 17, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright, for you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. You know what that means? Some of you are getting many things on a platter. For example, let me give you an example, a practical one. The teachings of this ministry are very edifying and very rich. And they are blessing lives. But it's so unfortunate that many people around the ministry will not be blessed. It's people from afar that their lives will be changing. Why? F familiarity breeds contempt. You get so used to it. What is he saying? You assume it's assumed knowledge. You think you know it, but you don't know it. Because wisdom is justified by our children. What is it? That's, that's a despising of what matters the most. That's what Esau did. The Bible calls him profane or fornicator. Profane. Birthright. Actually, remember, if you trace it back, 
Actually, the prophecy was that the older will serve the younger. Meaning, although Jacob might have skinned and all that, but Jacob was straight with Esau. Jacob's, the prophecy that was given to, to them was that Esau will serve Jacob. And Jacob said, all right, let's bargain now. Sell the birthright. Jacob did not steal it overnight. Is that true? And what happened? And Esau gave it up. And you know that there are three things when it comes to birthright. Number one is that when it comes to birthright, you don't need to write it. No, you get a double portion. Number two is that you get the, 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 the father's blessing. Like a benefactor. That when the father is living, Esau is going to apportion it to. And guess what? Number three, in the Old Testament, Esau would have become the next after Isaac. It would have been the father of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But because Esau too was profane, didn't value that which God actually placed a premium on. Therefore, the spirit of prophecy that should rest upon him. And through him, the lineage of the Messiah might have come. It didn't happen through him. He went through Jacob. That's why you trace it again then to David. Is that true? And that's why he said, Jesus, thou son of David. And Jesus responded. Because he's tracing him to Abraham, their father. They bypassed Esau. In discipline will ruin your life. It will waste your potentials. It will wa in discipline is a waster. Purpose fuels discipline. Channels resources. Decide the activity that you're engaging. Discipline can mean staying where you are put until God gives you word again. Discipline can be focusing on spiritual growth, not popularity. We live in a generation where somebody is in 100 level and the orientation is coming with from his home church is to come and start his own ministry. The question is, are you ready for it? Nothing bad, but have you been groomed? You who have not been taught, trying to teach others, you will become part of the problem of the Nigerian church. Because it's like a blind leading the blind. A tree does not have to be everywhere before it tries. Discipline stays there. A palm tree can be there for the next 89 years. It's just there. No matter the storm, it stays there. There are Christians running from pillar to post, running from denomination to denomination, cannot sit in one church for many years. Why? Because their needs are not being met in the church they are attending. They think the church is a business center. They don't know that the church is a family. We all have our issues, but we stay under God. We encourage one another. We are built by the word of God until we become what the scripture paints for us. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor discipline. A disciplined person is a focused person. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, set down at the right hand of the Father. Discipline is a focused person. Jesus said, I have a baptism to be but I have straightened my eye until it be accomplished. Discipline person is a focused person. Do you not know that I must be about my father's business? Discipline. Part of the signs of discipline is being focused. You cannot be everywhere if you want to do what God has called you to do. You must be where he has positioned you and you must do what he has sent you. Again, concerning discipline, you must learn to prune activities and streamline your focus. Remember, Paul was telling the church in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Look at verse 13. This is Paul pressing to where they go. He says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. This is Paul, a veteran in the faith, who had preached and traveled around different missionary journeys just to see that souls are saved. Paul, who said it is my ambition to not preach where Christ has already been named, but to go to the regions because as an apostle, he was a frontier, he was a pathfinder. He was a groundbreaker. Paul was focused to the very end, such that even in prison, 
He was writing letters. He was making sure that he was fulfilling his ministry. Focus. He takes focus to be a person of impact. Go and check the laser beam. It has to be focused. That light must be focused if it will penetrate. If there is no focus in your life, you will be struggling till eternity. If Jesus was not focused while he was on the cross, and then they said to him on the cross, Oh, ah, look at him. It is focused, listen, it is focused that will shield you from the criticisms of men. It is focused that will shield your ears from the applause of men. You've not done so much. God put in you 320 books. You want to write three. You wrote one. Everyone is clapping for you. You are the greatest author in the world, my friend. Appreciate it for one minute and go back to your study and begin to dig deep into what God actually wants you to do and become with your life. Are you learning something? Focus. Some of us, a little praise gets over our head. Some of us, a little discouragement. And we say, I'm not doing again. No. Focus. Focus. Stay with it. Even the word of God was tried seven times as of the purifying of silver. Focus. What are you doing now for God? Stay with it. What are you doing in your workplace that glorifies God and honors God and moves the organization forward? Stay with it. What are you doing as a student? You go to night class and after 30 minutes, then you are dozing. Tap yourself and wake yourself up and focus. Why? Don't say, eh, well, eh, yeah, this BSC too. Nigeria is bad. It doesn't matter. Listen, Nigeria is bad. Nigeria is bad. It's difficult to do well outside of the country if you are not intellectually sound. Ah, the favor of God will cover it. F listen, there is the place of favor. There is the place of competence. Two of them work together. Imagine David was not competent or Joseph was not competent. They say, it's favor, anyhow, anyhow. No, sir. Even favor, too, is an operation of the Spirit of God. And it can work for anyone. But favor is beautiful. When it comes to a person who has chosen to be disciplined, tell your neighbor discipline. When you find what you will die for, you have found what you can live for. When you find what you will die for, you have found what you can live for. Discipline yourself for the sake of godliness. Number three, way not to waste your life. Cherish relationships. Cherish relationships. This will bless you. Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Bless this the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Do you remember that psalm? Can we recite it together if you can? One, two, go. Bless this the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the Lord, and on his law does he meditate day and night. It shall be like a tree that is planted by the river. Uh -huh. He brings forth its fruit in season. His leaves do not wither. And in all that he does, he prospers. He says, but the ungodly are not so. They are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand. Sinners shall not stand in the congregation of the righteous. All right? And then he continues like that. You know what that means? That means that your associations, your relationships, your contacts, your friendships, can either be assets or liabilities in your life. In Romans chapter 16, from verse 1 to 16, you see about 26 names mentioned by Paul the Apostle, Tryphena and Tryphosa, Phoebe, Aquila, Priscilla, Andronicus, Junior, Rufus, his mother. And he mentions all of them. Why? He said this, Phoebe, he said these were people who stood with him, who worked with him association. No wonder Paul must have rubbed off on his co-laborers, Aquila and Priscilla. And that was why when Apollos the Alexandrian came, an eloquent man, very vast in scripture, mighty in scripture, the Bible says, but the limitation of his understanding was the baptism of John. And guess what? Because Aquila and Priscilla had been instructed properly, the, say, when you stay with the teacher of the word, after a while, what happens? There is a rub off. Anybody you work with rubs off on your life. Whether for good or for bad. But there is always the law of potential difference. Something is going to rub off on you if you work with the right person. Something is going to rub off on you if you work with the wrong person. It's true. That was why they could take Apollos aside 
And then they began to instruct him. And the Bible said they showed him the way of God more excellently. Why? Because an excellent Bible teacher taught them the scriptures. And who was that? Paul the Apostle. Are you seeing that? I could go from Genesis to Revelation to show you association. Lot was with Abraham. And because Lot moved with Abraham, God prospered Lot. Meaning that the prosperity of Lot was actually an extension of the covering of Abraham. When there was a separation and Lot go, went to pitch near Sodom, what happened? After a while, the Bible says the men of Sodom wanted to commit sexual immorality all right, with the angels that came to visit Lot. Why? Because Sodom was a place that was brimming with sexual immorality, idolatry, perversion, and all forms of things that you see today. So like a sin city. And guess what? God wanted to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot too would have been part of the destruction. Why? Association. The Bible says, He that walks with wise men shall be wise, and a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Iron sharpens iron, and a brother the countenance of his friend. Proverbs 13, 20. Proverbs 27, 17. Luke chapter 2 and verse 52. He says, And he grew, waxed strong. The Bible says, He grew in favor with God and with man. If God himself grew in favor with man, Why? Because ministry is actually people. Tell your neighbor ministry. It's people. Life is about relationships. It's about relationships. When you trivialize people, and I'm going to open this up. I'm going to take some time on this. Because I need to dig deep on the matter of relationships. I'm not talking of marital relationships now. Even though it also has its implications. Who you marry can help you reign or help you go into early grave. Do you see that? Who you marry can fast track your journey and they can slow your progress. Who you marry can be a blessing or a body, depending on who you marry. Are we together? But you also must know that who you marry oftentimes is a product of who you are because you will attract who you really are oftentimes. 90% of the times, except for some careless mistakes, most people attract who they really are. Are you following? Because God is just. Praise God. Praise God. Our lives are affected by our interactions with others. For example, your association, your relationships, Affect the possibilities that you can believe God for in your life. <laughs> this will bless you. <laughs> Are you ready? What did I say? Your relationships affect what now? The possibilities you can believe God for. How do I mean? Second Kings chapter 6, verse 1 to 7. The servant of the prophet came and he said to him, Master, this place where we are is too small for us. And then they went to court. All right? Three. They went to fell tree so that they could build a bigger space. Question one, how did that servant know or that son of the prophet know that we, we, we need a bigger space? It was because he was conscious that this prophet is not a local champion. He's a national prophet. We need space for this work to continue. Are you seeing that? Not only that, the move of the spirit through the prophet was very strong that that man knew that this ministry is a global one, or let me say national one, and we cannot afford to be mediocre. People are coming from all the ends of the earth, therefore we need space. Or it may just be that he believes that, listen, with what is on this man's life, let us do our best to expand. It's the expansion that we need now. Because if God could cause a, you know, valley or a floor, a sea of floor, to become, all right, one shekel, all right, uh, that means there's, there's something. So he had seen miracles upon miracles. And then his mind was open for the miraculous. Guess what? While they were felling the tree, the Bible says the axe head fell. Guess what? I thought if I was the one, I would have gone home, right? I would have said, the axe head has fallen tough. Maybe God, now this is how it happens. Your association rubs off on you positively and negatively. Meaning the limitation of your friends will soon become your limitation. You inherit both the limitation and the possibilities of your friends, if you are not careful. If your friends cannot believe God for daily bread, be sure that you will have a day concerning tomorrow's meal. Because they are your closest friends. You see their WhatsApp status every day. Listen, the, one of the ways not to waste your time is to mute some people on your WhatsApp because they are rubbing off on you more than the pastor of your church. You don't know. Some of you don't have your pastor's number. But that your friend that tells you, Corona, do you know it happened during COVID? I had to mute a lot of people. 
61,647 people now dead. 82,000 in China. 900,000. Ah, ah, ah. So I said, eh, mute it. Because it was sorcery that was going on. Minds were being manipulated. Sorcery that was programmed to believe more in impossibility than on what God is doing. Meaning the announcement on that person's status was more about what the enemy was doing, not what God is doing. Follow friends that give you a bigger picture of God that is scripture based. Follow God, friends that challenge you to trust God for provision. To stay with God and not compromise. And guess what? The prophet said, all right, where did it fall? What if he went to ask the wrong person question? He said, where did it fall? That one said, fall. Sir, is it falling you should be asking now? Or let's go back home. Do you see that? He said, no. This is where it fell. And the prophet took a stick. A stick. And threw it there. Do you know why? Elisha was able to do better than Elijah or did well. He saw the miracle closer than the sons of the prophet. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Elijah carries his mantle and hits it on Jordan and he parts into two. And Elisha was there. Why was Joshua able to take the children of Israel to the promised land? Every time Moses would encounter the glory of God, the Shekinah in the tent, Joshua would stay back. When Moses left, Joshua would still stay, basking in that presence. No wonder, when Joshua was to leave, Moses was to leave, God said, no, put some of your honor upon Joshua. The Bible says, Joshua, a man full of the Spirit, filled with the Spirit. And then he says, no, let him also have another dimension of the Spirit called the Spirit of Wisdom. He says, for Moses had laid his hands on him. Association comes with impartation. That's what I'm telling you. Some of you, 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 you trivialize spiritual things. You don't know that association is... Some of you are waiting for an impartation service. Impartation is happening every day. In your casual interactions, an impartation can take place. How do I know? Saul sends his men to go and capture David. David runs to Ramah, where Samuel, standing as one appointed over them, began to prophesy. They were prophesying. When the servants of Saul came, the Bible said they all prophesied. What? And then another set, they prophesied. Why? They came within the bandwidth of Paul's prophetic, sorry, Samuel's prophetic ministry. And guess what? Because of the law of proximity, something happened to them. In the days of Saul, now he now came to Saul's time. He said, ah, okay, I'm going to go see what's happening there. The Bible says when Saul got there, Saul prophesied naked from morning <laughs> till a king. The whole matter, all right, for jurisprudence, leadership, counseling, everything. Mm -mm. He prophesied from morning till evening. And then it became a parable in Israel. And the question was, is Saul also among the prophets? Why? Because you came into contact with the company of prophets. Therefore, you became another man. People are changing you more than what you know. People are changing you in greater measures than you realize. That's what I mean. You'll be surprised. Stay with men of faith. You'll be surprised. You will live there. And for the next few weeks, you seem as though you can take the whole world. But work with chicken. Work with mediocres. They will give you 1,001 reasons why it will not succeed. And by the time you rise from that place, they will tell you, I hope with these few points of mine, I'll be able to convince and not to convince you that you will never make it in life. Jabez's mother named him Jabez, a son of sorrow. What? Why? Because of our own experience. Listen, people can use their experience to limit your own life. They will tell you, listen, no, that's how I tried it, I failed too. Don't do it too. You cannot do it too. Only God knows what people have told you that have become a stronghold in your mind. By the power in the name of Jesus, they are shattered today. Amen. May, I'm praying for you. May God expose you to what we bring out, what he has put in you. In the name of Jesus. Relationships. Relationships. How about Genesis? How, now, now, how do you cultivate relationships? Because there are many church people who don't know how to cultivate relationships. Number one. Genesis chapter 18, verse 1 to 3. Genesis chapter 18, verse 1 to 3. Cultivating relationships. Hospitality. Abraham saw men, and these were angels of God. 
and he rushed to entertain them. He didn't know that he was entertaining angels unawares. The Bible says by the time they were done, they told him according to the time of life. Your wife will conceive and bring forth a son. What? Are you with men no stop and all that? No, no, forget about that. Why? Association. Hospitality. Some of you need to begin to cultivate hospitality. Listen, hospitality is also a manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit in your life. True believers are hospitable people. Hospitality is an arm of the helps ministry. Some of us just need to learn not hospitality. Some of you are already hospitable, but there's no courtesy. And all of them go together. Courtesy. And I need to talk about it. Genesis 24, 18 to 24. Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, put your hand under my thigh and swear to me, go get, my, go get a wife for my son Isaac. And Eliezer said, oh God of my father, go God of my master. And then he prayed to God. And then he said, okay, a, a woman that will come feed my camels, and then give water and all that. And guess what? The Bible says that Rebekah came, and Rebekah was courteous. Rebekah was beautiful, but she had character. Listen, attractiveness is not beauty. He says, an ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit, which is of great price before God, meaning character is beautiful. Hello, sir. Okay, let me put it this way. Character is beauty. Tell your neighbor, character is beauty. A lady that should speak like a lady. She's suddenly talking like a guy. She's, ah, forget, ah. No courtesy. Good afternoon, sir. Hey, you, you meet somebody. It doesn't matter whether it's an airplane or on the road. Good afternoon. You can't even say that. Talk less of good afternoon, sir. Sir, okay. Sir, it's no more in your dictionary. Because even your dad, there's no sir. Your friend, there's no sir for nobody. You say, good afternoon. Some will even greet grumpily. Good afternoon. So they are greeting you good afternoon. Rather than for you to also say good afternoon, you say, what is good about the afternoon? Ah. Many of us have missed our next levels, our Kairos moment, because we treated people wrongly. Listen, your spirituality cannot be trusted if your interaction with men is not good. The sign that you are truly in a good re relationship with God is that you are following peace with men. That you have good relationship with people. Be kind. Listen to others empathetically. Show empathy. Some of us only like to be heard. We don't want to hear others. That's why people are not your friends. Because every meeting with you is a lecture. You don't know what they are going through. Someone said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. How true? Do you even care about your parents? Do you care about your siblings? Do you care about your family? Do you care about your colleagues? It's just about you. People chat you on WhatsApp. Next thing, you're already telling them all your problems. You will repel them from your life. Even if they were meaning to help you. You know, there are people who are seasonal friends. When they are broke, they reach out for quick 2K. And they send an epistle as long as Ephesians. But when they get the quick 2K, they send John 19.30. Jesus wept. Kind of text message. They will not even write thank you very much. They will not say thank you. Some of them cannot say thanks. T-N-X. As though their fingers have developed, uh, I don't want to, uh, we close, you know, with, uh, let me not go into some biological. Are you following me now? <laughs> Why? Some of you don't know that these little things concerning relationships, Learn to accept people for who they are. Don't try to change people. Be a blessing to them. Add value to them. Bring constructive criticism. But listen, there is nobody that will want to be in the company of a person who always rebukes and really encourages. Show appreciation when people help you. Say thank you. Say I'm sorry. Some marriages have been broken because... Nobody wants to say, I'm sorry. The husband should just simply kneel down or find a way to pet his wife and say, I'm truly sorry. I was wrong. No. Some wives should just tell their husband, I'm truly, honey, I'm sorry. No. And how will I say, how will I say, I'm sorry first? In our house, we are lions, we are tigers. My friend is not. <laughs> uh, 
Some people bring culture and tradition and force it on scripture. Thank you very much. Simple things. Next week, we're going to pick it up. I'm going to share with you other things. So number one, we talked about what live for purpose. Number two, a disciplined life. Check it out. Check it out and be sure. Number three, cherish relationships. Some people will reach out to you. I, I know some people, even as a minister, who only reach out to me when school is in session. One school closes or they are on strike. Even though people say we don't know which, which one strike pass, Asu or Thunder. Once Asu strikes like this, the, you are no more their father, you are no more their mentor, you are no more their disciple, they have a new pastor in town, a new apostle in town. Then when there is a challenge or when school resumes, then they will say, they will first come with a guilt trip. You know what they will tell you? Pastor, you forgot me. You never asked of me. You never cared about me. Ah, uh -uh. eh. Did you ask of your pastor? Some of you don't check up on people. Except they check up on you, you will never check up on them. To you, you feel cool. Sometimes it can be arrogance. Stop overrating yourself. You need others. You and I need people. I need you. If you were not here, would I be preaching? Am I? Listen. <laughs> I cannot be talking to the screen all my life. Ministries to people, not screens. I need people. The reason why some of you are here is because we have relationships, right? And the reason why you will bring other people is because you have relationship with those people. It's rare to go and meet somebody and say, you don't know, I don't know you before, but you are coming to our church. Or else I will kill you here. What? You can be arrested for that. Relationships. Relationships can open doors that your competence cannot open for you. Relationships can also shut doors against you. A man would have destroyed Esther, Mordecai, and all the Jews if not for Esther's relationship with the king. Mephibosheth will have died the way he was if not that Jonathan and David had a relationship. Will your name open doors or close doors against your children? Think about it. Do you know that your relationship can shorten your journey to destiny? The, the asu that you would have entered into because you didn't have the right person. Do you know what it meant for Jesus to want to give the Holy Communion, what we call the Last Supper, right? And he said, no, don't worry, go to that inn, tell the keeper this and that. Or, okay, the triumphal entry. You see a cold tie, tell them when they ask you who needs it, that the master needs it. You think it was not relationship? Who knows, maybe he did cheer for that guy one day, see, because it was Jesus. They will collect money from you now because you are Jesus and so. They will collect money from you. Maybe he did cheer for one, one day. This I said, no, 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 keep the change. Some of you that are artisans, that do fabricator, fascinator. So somebody did a wrong fascinator that fell on the bride's head on the wedding day. The, the butterfly there rolled at the moment the guy wanted to put a ring. And they read meaning to it. They said the marriage cannot work because if the butterfly fell, and then the, you are wondering, some of you did cake for somebody, and on their wedding day, they could not focus on the wedding. It was, the cake was about to, eh, they, they were just praying, can we, can we just finish and cut this cake? They did cut the cake, they macheted the cake quickly. And you wonder why you don't have customers. I'm already flame, I'm already flame. You are not chatting students and undergraduates. Is it your grandmother that will be your customer? Relationships, listen, 80% of people, I, you know, I was a student of Bible school, uh, business school, uh, Bible school, but business school too. 80% of the clients you will get, get will be based on your relationship with them. Yeah, you do advertisement, you show the value of your product, all those things are good and they are important. But listen, if you cannot treat people well, if you don't have good relationships, one referral can open doors to your business, to your ministry. I'm preaching in Oshun this weekend. Oh my God, it's going to be awesome and powerful and glorious and miraculous. Pray for me. But you know what? His relationship that is taking me there. I'm a good preacher. I know I'm a good preacher by the grace of God. But I know that it's not my good preaching that I say. There are other better preachers than myself. Do you see that? But what? Relationship. Somebody will recommend and say, no, no, bring that brother. Bring that brother. And I know when I get there now, maybe about 20 other opportunities. And the door of Oshun will be open like that. Why? You don't need all the doors to open. You just need the right doors to be open. And I'm praying for somebody following this week. 
that by the message of God in this month of November, may God send help us to your life and your destiny. That will open the right doors for you. And you too, may you be helpers of others. In the name of Jesus. Let me tell you how it works. One good turn deserves another. Let me tell you, tell you how it works. The Bible says, cast your bread upon many waters. For after many days, they will return to you. He said, give a portion to seven and a portion to eight. For you don't know the one that will yield. Now, this is how it works. If you are not generous, if you are not cheerful, if you are not friendly, if you are not humble, if you don't have character, if you are not helping others and solving problems for others, don't look for anybody that will solve problem for you. Joseph was in prison. Although he was a prisoner, he was still starving with his gift. That was why, even though it took two years, at least he was remembered. Abby. Somebody say, hey, oh, two years. It's true, the Bible says two full years. But we can pick a lesson. Whether two years or 20 years, because he solved the problem for somebody, good relationship skills, what happened? The person later remembered. Meaning there are people today, when they remember you, will they cry or will they rejoice? Relationships. It has changed my life. Before this year ends now, I know what some relationship will bring to me. Listen, one of the ways to test, and, and I'll soon close now, one of the ways to test whether you are doing well with your, in your relationships, I can give you many things, but let me give you one. On your birthday, what happens on your birthday? Now, most times, if you're a preacher or a music minister, you'll be popular on your, you'll be more popular on your birthday, right? People will share your picture. No, I'm not talking about that. Because you don't have a relationship with those people. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying on your birthday, those that really know you for who you are, what do they say about you on your birthday? I know some will lie. You are very wicked, but they will say, she is full of power, full of love. Even you, you know. Bros, you lied. I'm full of wickedness, you lied. At least tell me the truth on my birthday. But really, listen to what people say. Especially the things people say consistently. Do you see that? Maybe somebody says, oh, she's so humble. Another person says, oh, she's so down to earth. Another person says, oh, she's so selfless. Listen to what people, especially people that are truthful and sincere, that don't really care whether you put them in your bad book later. People that don't need anything from you, but will tell you the truth and will not charge you for it. Listen to for what they have to say about you. Constructive criticism. Hear what they have to say. That will tell you how you, your interaction has been. If everybody has been saying, oh, you, you forget somebody, but on your birthday you send 12 pictures, as if you are doing a beauty competition. No. Your life should be so impactful that even after you are dead, when those alive remember your bed, when your birthday comes, they remember your, you. Why? Because you made a mark. What God is looking for is not a life of many activities. It's a life that is lived for the glory of God, for the edification of others, making an impact. Where God has positioned you, making a difference, even with the little that you have. You are not put down by the criticism of men, and you are not overbloated by the praises of men. Your identity in Christ is what gives you assurance and security. You are secure in what God has called you to be, and therefore you decide to live by God's purpose, by design, and then you live a life of discipline towards the fulfillment of the vision that God has given you, and then you steward your relationships. All right, remember, stewardship of relationships. Relationships. Don't forget it. Value it. The people you trivialize today, they may be the key to your next level. Even if they don't become the key to your next level, at least the Bible says, follow peace. Without many, all men, and holiness, without which no man, shall see the Lord. He says, as long as, as much as it lies in your power, Romans 14, 12, he says, strive, labor hard to be at peace with all men. These are some of the ways to live a life that is meaningful, to avoid a wasteful existence. Are you blessed, somebody? Yes. All right, rise up, one of prayer. Father Almighty, we receive grace tonight that we will not waste our lives that will be purpose-driven. We will be kingdom-minded. We will be genuine and deliberate. We would appreciate the relationships that you have put around us, our mentors, our friends, and our mentees. And Lord God, we will be disciplined. We will cultivate discipline. And our lives will bring you play up. That at the end of our journey, we would have served your will in our generation. 
Thank you, precious Father.